Hello. Welcome to today's session on Green DevOps, building sustainable software. Here is Nilja, a DevOps community guy, building various DevOps communities in my local region like Google Cloud, CNCF, Docker, Hashicorp, Grafana, Hellmanger, more than 15 plus hackathons, and yeah, a DevOps engineer. The first thing comes is I have all my data on cloud, so I don't emit carbon dioxide. Is that true? Let's think for a while. As we have hosted our websites on cloud, we have stored our images, videos on cloud. So where they are stored? They are stored in the data centers. And the data centers consume a lot of energy, a lot of power. So they do uh, use, utilize the electricity and different powers. And yeah, they are made carbon dioxide, a lot of heat from that. So indirectly, you are also emitting carbon dioxide by it. Let's understand how we can measure in our project and try to reduce them. So as we reveal innovations driven by software development, we also must undertake how much carbon footprint we are utilizing or having an impact in the carbon footprint of the environment. So what is green DevOps? Green DevOps is a general terminology to implement carbon footprint and the efficiency of carbon footprint into the regular DevOps practice. It's integration of sustainable practice in software development lifecycle. Unlike the tradition development, where we focus on spread and functionality, and this kind of uh, cycle, we will consider the environmental considerations on the first priority and then the speed of functionality. So, uh, that's uh, just a change, focusing on the carbon footprint majorly, focusing on the environment firstly, and then everything comes back secondly. So here comes what are the benefits of green DevOps, reduce energy consumption. So first thing is optimize resources utilization through all the development process. So we need to try to optimize all the things that we are working and try to lower the energy consumptions and that will also help you to cut down your cost and also minimize the carbon footprint. Of your software development. Whatever you are building, just try to utilize lesser energy if possible. Not it's it's another thing like everyone will force you to do that. So yeah, lesser energy consumption anywhere will use lesser uh, electricity, lesser data centers, storage. Everything will come and it will have an impact on the carbon footprint of the ecosystem. And eventually your Cost will also be saved. That is also managing. Next is improve resource efficiency. So the first thing, the some of the examples which I can give differently is when we use uh, some of the VMs, and when we stop the VM, we forget to uh, delete the disk which was attached to it. We forget to uh, remove the static IP attached to it. Some of, the, some of the things that we can do and it will eventually help to lesser the resource utilization. Another one of the other example is we need to try to find out if we had taken 100 GB of storage and we are just utilizing 40 or 50 GB, then other 60 GB are wasted. So we try to utilize them in a proper manner. We need to uh, monitor them how much we are utilizing on a like harsh day. If we are just going up like maximum to 60 percent, then yeah, we can eventually cut down right to 70 or 80 percent of the storage. So that will eventually improve our resource efficiency and it will help a lot. Next is enhance software quality. You can also improve for utility optimization, infrastructure resizing that I already told, efficient testing process. 
So how the core optimization can help you? So when you have some functions running synchronously and it is taking a lot of time, so it will eventually take a lot of time to for data store, data latency, data transfer sort of thing to come to the user and user. You need to improve that. Eventually, if you will improve core optimization, then the energy burst time, energy output, uh, execution time, product execution time, function time will improve. That will eventually improve all the things. The core optimization thing which the developers can help you out and we can try to implement that in our regular practices. So these are some of the things which we can implement in our regular life. To implement some sort, some portion of the great DevOps portion in our regular life cycles or the product development. Next comes the GHG protocol. So there should be some standard to compare uh, how much percentage or how we are emitting carbon dioxide. Eventually, for most of the products, there is ISO standard which is available. Uh, which is there for each and every product. Similarly, the GHG protocol, the greenhouse gas protocol. Yeah. So here comes the different scopes in which manner the carbon emission is there. The first is direct emission. So, and direct emission when we burn a coal. When we burn coal directly, then the amount of carbon emission of that is considered in the direct emission. Other is indirect emission related to purchase energy when we purchase electricity. When we use electricity, the coal is burned or any other thing is done, then it is considered in the indirect emission. Other is other indirect emissions can be like business travel. So we are not have purchasing energy, we are just buying a ticket of a plane. So yeah. Whenever a plane is running over there, it consumes fuel. And also, it will emit the carbon dioxide. So, in same manner, there are different things which the GHG protocol has classified as the main major thing in most of the C scope. And let's see how it is classified in the DevOps. So the GHG scope has, if we store anything in private cloud, then it comes in second and third scope. When we uh, deploy anything in public cloud, then it comes in the third scope. When we deploy a hybrid cloud, and it comes in first and third scope. Similarly, for the if we just deploy the front end, then it comes in the third scope. So similarly, you can understand how the carbon footprint impacts in the DevOps and where we deploy. It also matters in the private cloud, public cloud, or hybrid cloud. So this is uh, just a simple overview. You can go to Green Software Foundation and have more overview about this. So here comes the carbon intensity formula. So it helps to measure how much uh, carbon utilization is used by you as per some of the ratios. So SCI equals E into I plus M whole equals per R. Where all the things are energy consumed by software, energy carbon dioxide emitted, carbon emitted through software, carbon emitted through hardware, functional unit. This is how software scales. So per user, per app, per device, per unit. So per R is per R per something per unit. E is energy consumed. Uh, I is the carbon emitted. And M is carbon emitted hardware, the software is done. You can understand and this is a standard formula if you want to calculate the carbon intensity used by your product in a particular time and particular region. Yeah, yeah. So this you can definitely do that. So and some of the main major cloud providers also have their some of the tools which directly helps you out to get the amount of carbon footprint your resources are utilizing for AWS you have AWS carbon footprint too for Google Google carbon footprint for Microsoft Azure Azure sustainable calculator so most of the 
companies, also sorry, most of the cloud provider are also helping to reduce the carbon as it will eventually help to make the better environment for each and every person living on the earth. Another comes is this is the best thing which I love is uh, Cloud Carbon Footprint is an open source and free tool that you can make dashboards for free. Uh, you just need to sign up and uh, make a, a dashboard considering your uh, things. So yeah, you can see the dashboards like this, and it will eventually help you understand in a better way how your product and how your services are utilizing the car, uh, the energy and emitting the carbon. So next comes how we can reduce. We have learned what are the impacts, but yeah, we also need to understand how we can reduce in different manner. So first is catch static data. When we catch static data, the when the user requires the same data, so it will eventually take from the directly from the cache, not going to server. So it will cut down the load. And it will eventually improve the software policy, software products, and also it will also consume less energy. Next is develop unused storage resources. As I already told, when we stop the VM, the boot is attached to it, doesn't directly delete. We need to enable that. So we need to delete the un unused storage resources right there. Next is implement stateless design. So how to how to do that? Everyone knows, but why it is beneficial is when you run different functions asynchronously and synchronously. Then what are the difference? When you run synchronously and if once the functions take a lot of lot of time, it was supposed to take two uh, two seconds and it is taking twenty seconds. So the another function after that which is attached to that uh, takes needs to rest for like needs to take a longer time almost 18 seconds for uh, more so it will it is beneficial if you try to implement the functions parallelly not parallelly but yeah after it not dependent on everybody that's the thing do non-urgent processing request so this is the thing don't uh, do parallel processing Sort of thing, if uh, not necessary, because when we do parallel processing, it will take a lot of compute and it will also take a lot of CPUs. So when we do utilize serverless thing, serverless, so it will spin up more infra when we do uh, parallel processing. So it is beneficial if it's not urgent, then you can queue the process one after the other. So it will eventually do the same thing in the same infra with the smaller cost and also solar energy scale down infra when not in use you can also eventually do it with auto scaling policies and also you can use serverless cloud services because it, it will automatically do this for you scale up and scale down when necessary this is software to design you need to consider making a software design properly software in, in production and development, this is choice of instance type. You need to understand how your utilization would be. Some of the things are on spot. Some of people may uh, see reserve. So on spot majorly are preferred because as it will eventually use a lesser storage and also less money. So it's beneficial for you. Yeah, but to minimum auto scaling groups containers, everything, change the region or zone as per the software, sorry, as per the carbon emission rate in that region at the time as possible. Next comes cloud awareness. So, uh, how people can renew the production is already there. But yeah, there are some of the things which could be uh, done. So first comes is temporal shifting. Temporal shifting is when uh, we have made a resource in a region 
where carbon emission rate is reduced. Uh, sorry, at a scale up a lot. So we can, if it's possible, we can shift the energy source in the region where the carbon emission rate is lesser. So that's the thing. Next comes the demand shaping. So when we store videos, when we store images, so at that time, if we uh, store the video, store the images in a lesser pixel form, the video was almost, uh, let's say, of 10 MB. Then, if, if possible, then we can cut down to 2 MB or 5 MB and then store to storage. So it will eventually utilize lesser storage. And also, it will uh, eventually help you uh, to reuse the carbon footprint of that. Another, uh, another good example can be given as if you uh, run a Jenkins server. So CSD and there are worker nodes. So uh, some uh, some of the worker nodes are not needed now. And you can shift and postpone the work when the carbon footprint, when the carbon emission rate is less. That are the thing. Next comes spatial shaping. So one of the good thing is let's take an example. How the load balancer works? Load balance if the user is in US region, then the load balancer will see, uh, will get the resources from the uh, app or website deployed in the US region directly, not from the like, other region of Asia, Asia Pacific or something. So in similar manner, if we can uh, implement that, is the user who uh, user should get the output where the carbon efficiency is good it will be beneficial google tried to imp uh, implement this in one of the thing and uh, in the one of the recent reports they found that 51 percent more carbon footprint was reduced so yeah that is a great thing if we can try to implement this not in a hectic manner but yeah slowly and gradually we, we can try to do this and it will eventually help us to use lesser resources and also impact lesser on the current footprint. Next comes fin offs plus green offs. Is that true? When we are trying to implement uh, green offs, that is like a green DevOps sort of thing. And also we are utilizing lesser resources, optimizing more of the things. Yeah, green ops is also there. It will eventually help in the moment also and helping on you. Connect with me for any queries you have. Thank you. Have a nice day.